I, I think we, we can start. Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. This webinar is part of a webinar series that we call the Tuesday lunches with Rita and where we discuss various immunity and inflammation related topics. I'm Karin Wouters, a pediatric rheumatologist from Leuven. The, my co-chair is Fabrizio De Benedetti, pediatric rheumatologist from Rome. And today we are very happy to have Patrick Brodin with us to discuss different aspects of immune dysregulation and cytokine storms, including some comments on COVID-related pathologies. Petra Brodin doesn't really need to be introduced, but as you know, he's a clinical scientist, a professor of pediatric immunology with a great expertise in translational immunology in uh, children's diseases. He recently joined Imperial College of London, uh, where he bears the Garfield Western chair. Um, we look forward to this webinar and we look forward also to have your input. So please, may I invite you to ask questions in the questions bar already during the presentation. You can also use the chat box if needed for any message or comment, uh, but we look forward to have an interactive discussion after a fascinating presentation. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Karin, and thanks everyone for joining me. I hope you can now see my main screen. It looks like you do, and not my presenter mode or my presentation mode. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to speak to this uh, network of experts uh, all over Europe. And uh, what I'll try to do today is say a few words about, from my point of view, about immune dysregulation and and specifically i want to touch upon a topic which is very dear to me which has to do with how we can try to make immune systems more interpretable how we can try to make them more understandable and so um if i switch my screen here um first of all let me blow this up a little bit so cytokine storms or immune dysregulation is obviously a topic that is on everybody's mind due to COVID-19, but it's obviously also related to, it's something that we've known about for a long time. It can be triggered by a variety of different conditions underlying this. And in my opinion, immune dysregulation and immune regulation are not entirely well-defined topics, but rather it's a, a description of a variety of different, uh, in my opinion, conditions. Um, and so it could be an infection that has gone um, off the rails, it can be cancer, it can be uh, drug-induced, such as in the case of a cytokine release syndrome with uh, immunotherapy of cancer, for example. And the driver cell can vary a lot between innate cells, such as uh, anti-M presenting cells, mononuclear cells, or uh, T cells and B cells. So it's really a, a, a variety of conditions and this is why I think we need some slightly better definitions of what we're actually talking about. We know that the immune system is triggered by all of these things and we know that it has to be because in individuals that fail to trigger their, uh, an appropriate immune response, severe infections as in, in the case of immunodeficiencies are very dangerous obviously. Um, and the mediators of a cytokine but, storm... Uh, but, yeah? uh, I hate yeah. to interrupt you, but we have a problem. The slides, they look very narrow. Like, like That's just this particular one. I think it's just going to look better in a minute, no? Okay, okay, okay. No, no, but, but it's, just, it's just half of the size of the slide yeah. is occupied by the graphs. I don't... Could it be that I need to swap my display? Would it be better if I do it that way? No, no, that's even worse. Mm -hmm. That's okay. very strange. So I wonder if it fits just this particular slide. So if we go back to this one, look, this does this look better? This, this looks is, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So then it's just that I probably made this little image too small. Sorry about that. I've tried to read it, and then with the future slides, they will be easier to read, I think. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sorry for interrupting you, Peter. I want I wanted to make sure that we didn't have a technical issue. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. So this is from a this is actually from a paper by Feigenbaum and, and Carl June in New England describing some of the cytokine storms that we know from a variety of conditions with a focus on uh, cytokine release syndromes in 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 CAR T cell treatments 
And here we see some of the mediators, such as TNF, interferon gamma, inter interleukin-6, and so on, and their respective uh, well-approved and, and well-known drugs. And what we can immediately see from this rather complex slide, I hope you can read it, is that there's a lot of interaction points and there's a lot of nodes in this network and which one to hit in an ideal way in a particular condition is far from certain and we really don't, in my opinion, don't really know that. And oftentimes we, we, we try something and then we try something else, but we don't have very sort of well precision uh, based treatments there. The, the other thing is that, as you, you all know here, that um, the presentation of a cytokine release syndrome or a cytokine storm can be very variable, depending on what the underlying triggering condition might be, or um, whether there is a particular cytokine released in a particular organ, you would have a very different presentation. And this is another thing that makes this really complicated, because it's not only uh, undefined at the immunological level, but it's also very variable and undefined at the symptomatology and, and clinical presentation level. So what all this boils down to is that, in my opinion, what we really should focus on to try to understand all of these conditions is to, tr is to get a better understanding of what immune regulation and immune dysregulation is. And so this brings me to my first point of discussion within this webinar, which has to do with metrics of immune health. So if someone comes to me and they say, my immune system doesn't work, I'm infected all the time, or my child has a recurrent infection over and over again, I really don't have a clear set of measurements that I can make to accurately define whether that individual child has a healthy immune system or not. This is contrasting with, let's say, uh, the liver or the kidneys or the heart, where we know exactly what the definition of a, a well-functioning organ actually is. And obviously the immune system is not one organ, it's a system-wide um, network of white blood cells. So it's much more complex in that way, but still we really should try to work hard, uh, work towards getting metrics of immune health, in my opinion. Because oftentimes we measure the numbers of neutrophils or the numbers of NK cells or B cells or T cells. Sometimes we measure one of the mediators by which these cells communicate with one another, but neither of these measurements are sufficient to tell us what the entire network of cells are actually doing at any given time. And so this brings me to the field of systems immunology, which basically tries to do exactly this. By trying to measure all of the white blood cells, at least present in the blood, at any given time point, and then measuring their activation state, their functional properties, their phenotypes, their numbers, as well as trying to capture some of the mediators by which these cells communicate. The field of systems immunology has a potential to actually better describe the state of the overall system rather than just one player at a time. And what I'll try to convince you of today is that if we were successful in this regard, human immune systems in patients um, would be a lot more interpretable and we would be able to define better what we mean by cytokine storms. And if we talk about um, systems immunology, it's important to note that every one of us is incredibly different from one another. We all have a fingerprint in our blood, which is the immune cell proportions and the cytokine levels and the protein levels overall. And so um, one way to get around that variability among human individuals is to follow people over time. And we don't always do that in the clinic, but I, I would argue that sometimes the dynamics and the changes over time can be incredibly important and powerful. So what I'm illustrating here is a cytokine level, let's say IL-6 or IL-5 or something, that increases in circulation. And then after that, this eosinophil population is degranulating and being activated. This suggests that there's a, actually a, a causal relationship between the two that we can investigate further. And, and in this way, um, by looking at coordinated changes over time uh, in our patients, I think we will get a better understanding of what, uh, what we should target and what the cause of the problem is.
So what, to illustrate this with a study that we published a few years ago, this is in healthy adult individuals. We basically followed individuals with four samplings over the course of a year to try to understand whether there was seasonal variation in the immune system in healthy middle-aged individuals. And by doing this, we could infer relationships between specific cell populations and plasma protein levels. So the cell populations are here in the corner here, and the plasma proteins are over here. And if there is a positive relationship, there's a blue line connecting the two. If there's a negative association, there's a red line. And, and some of these I've highlighted here, which shows that circulating levels of specific white blood cells are inversely correlated with specific chemokine levels, for example, suggesting again that this variability that we see, if we just take one blood sample, actually um, includes a lot of hidden structure. There's a lot of order in this system, but we just haven't fully uncovered that order yet. Um, one way to do so, I would say, is to measure the immune system in the blood at multiple layers. So we typically combine measurements of the single cells with plasma protein levels and sometimes transcripts or mRNA levels. There are many other measurements one can make, but these are cost effective and, and relatively easy to do. Um, ideally, by stimulating the cells directly ex vivo, you could get a better understand of whether they're functionally primed in a certain way, and that would give additional information. The other thing I would like to say is that with these new technologies, we are, we are ready for a new type of immunological investigation, in my opinion. In, in traditional settings, we've, we've started with the disease that we describe in our patients, and then we often devise, so we de design an animal model that ideally replicates the, the condition we want to study. And then we perform mechanistic investigation in the animal model, to try to understand what cell causes inflammation or what triggers what and so on. And then ideally, we try to define a, a path towards translation back to the human patients. The problem with this is that oftentimes the model is imperfect for the human disease and we fail to translate back to patients. And we might spend years investigating a condition without being able to return back to a new treatment for the disease. What I would argue is that in this new form of more complex and comprehensive measurements performed directly in human patients, we, we can skip uh, some of that uh, reductionist animal experiments by looking directly in the human patients at the, in, with great level of detail. We could try to form hypotheses about what factor regulates what other factor and what causes the disease. And then we can try to design either animal experiments or in vitro reductionist mechanistic experiments to test that particular hypothesis. And my belief, at least, is that that will increase our chances of being able to return back to the patients with new treatment options sooner because we are skipping that um, sort of uh, leap of, of the animal, which is, too soon at least, which, which would risk uh, getting lost in translation. The other thing I want to bring... Sure. Translate into which language? Oh, my bad. That's Siri. Um, so, um, the other thing I wanted to say is that when we talk about human immune systems, I already mentioned a little bit about immune variation. And what we know is that even healthy individuals vary tremendously over the course of life, with age, with sex, with uh, smoking, with, uh, with uh, specific viruses like CMV, EBV, and so on. So the levels of a particular white blood cell, even in healthy people, can vary enormously. This gives rise to this unique fingerprint that I mentioned earlier, which is basically the composition of cells in my blood, which differs from that of Fabrizio's or Kathleen um, and, and other people. Now, what's interesting is that the baseline state, which is basically my immune composition, is unique to me, but it's also stable over time. So when I have an infection or I get a vaccine, everything changes. But then after a few weeks, in an ideal scenario, I find my way back to my baseline state. And that is relatively stable over the course of months and years and so on. 
Um, and so this is another thing that we can use to better understand immune dysregulation by knowing someone's baseline state and then relating the state at you know, clinical presentation to that, we might be able to better understand what's going on and what's, what's dysregulated in this particular patient. When it comes to the um, what determines the composition of my immune system, me and my colleagues at Stanford University looked at this a few years ago in healthy twins, and we estimated the amount of variance among healthy people's immune system that could be attributed to heritable and non-heritable factors. And what we found is that the vast majority of all of our immune traits are explained by non-heritable factors. So the environment in which we live largely shape our immune systems. Now, obviously genetics is important and we know that from monogenic immunodeficiencies and, and, and auto-inflammatory diseases, for example, where the presentation can be dramatic caused by a particular gene defect. But we also know that patients with the exact same mutation might have a completely different presentation. And that is due to the fact that the environmental imprinting is so different. So even monozygotic twins are very similar early in life, but as they go across their, uh, their lifespan, they diverge from one another and become decreasingly similar to, another, to one another. So, um, and then another concept, which I think is interesting to bring up in terms of trying to understand human immune system variation better, is to think about whether we can find discrete groups of individuals, people with different immunotypes, individuals that have more similar immune systems than you would expect by random chance, people that are unrelated from one another fam in, in their sort of ancestry, but still have more similar immune systems than you would expect. We've looked at this quite, quite, quite intensely, actually. And in our experience, we never find such groups of people. We've never been able to identify robust immunotypes. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that the variation doesn't tell us anything. So what I'm showing you here is a principal component analysis of immune cell composition measurements. So we measure the composition of about 100 white blood cell types in the blood of 380 people. And what we see is that there's a gradual variation. There's a sort of a, a continuous uh, distribution, which is what I already told you. There are no discrete groups. But depending on where you are on this discrete distribution actually carries some important information. So what we did here was we stimulated the blood samples from these patients. And then we tried to predict whether someone would respond strongly or weak to um, to, to a particular stimulation. And here's a, um, a, a mathematical operation, which is uh, called the partial least square regression, which tells us that we can actually, we can actually predict quite accurately about 125 different white blood cell functional responses in vitro by only looking at the cell composition before stimulation. So what does that mean? Well, it means that cells stimulate each other, they inhibit each other, and the relative proportions of my blood tells you something about how I'm going to respond to a stimulation. And we could summarize this by three latent vectors, which are these three lines here, with relative proportions of all these white blood cells. And furthermore, what this, what this also tells us is that we can use this inherent information in our immune systems to actually begin to dissect what determines uh, my sort of immune cell state. What we did here is we projected these individuals and their blood samples onto this three-dimensional space. And what you see is that in the dark areas here, those are the youngest individuals, about eight years and onwards. And up in the yellow, which are more heterogeneous, are the oldest individuals. And they follow a sort of red line here, which is the aging axis. So you could basically fit a line and say, wherever you are on this age axis, that's your immunological age. And what determines your immunological age, what we found in this study was that 
CMV being zero positive to cytomegalovirus pushes you further along the age axis of your immune system, irrespectively of your biological age. So think of it as a 20 year old with CMV having an immune system that has the same age as a 30 year old without CMV. Um, and and this, this is just one example. I'm sure there will be hundreds of other factors similar to this one. Smoking, EBV, flu, how many flu episodes you've had, and so on and so forth. Vaccines, probably. All of these things probably determine the state of our immune systems. And I, what I envision for the future is that we would be able to profile someone's immune system, taking these complex measurements into account, and then be able to diagnose exactly what changes do I need to make to be able to push this individual from a disease state to a healthier state? And I think now we are approaching something that could become a more interpretable human immune system, where immune dysregulation can actually be, can actually be summarized and, and, and a recipe for intervention can be defined, which could be um, removal of 5% of B cells, increase IL-6 levels, decrease uh, gamma interferon levels, and so on and so forth. And we could start to play with combinations of therapies and so on in a data-driven way to, put, to push someone's immune system from one end of the spectrum to the other. And so obviously this is a bit futuristic and almost science fiction, but I think this is kind of where we are heading. We are not there yet. So. Let me just uh, sort of tie this into some of the things that we've learned by sars cov 2 infections over the past couple of years. So um, what you all know is that the sars cov 2 infection has vastly different consequences and outcomes among different individuals. We have the acute infection, which can be mild or severe, and then we have the post-infectious disorders, such as the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, adults, uh, potentially neonates, and maybe also induced by vaccines. We have the uh, long COVID, which we still poorly understand uh, what, what that is and whether that's a form of immune dysregulation or not. So to summarize um, what we've learned about severe and mild acute COVID-19, these seminal papers by the COVID human genetic effort and, and Jean-Laurent Casanova's uh, lab showed basically that um, the type 1 interferon uh, response is the most critical determinant of disease severity. Early on during disease course, you need to have a robust type 1 interferon response in order to um, avoid severe, severe disease and viral replication. And this is due to um, and this can be uh, abolished by either inborn errors of immunity in the sensors or the signaling pathways towards type 1 interferon responses, or by neutralizing autoantibodies to type 1 interferons, which um, are increasingly common um, with, with age, to, to, to our surprise, but, but that was the finding. And for, um, for young children, what determines disease severity and why children seem to be protected from severe uh, COVID-19 is not entirely clear, but one of the factors that probably plays a role is that their mucosal membranes and the local immune response in the airways and, and mouth is uh, much more primed and ready with better um, uh, type 1 interferon responses, as showed by a number of studies by now. Uh, I think there are additional factors that play a role, and I'll get back to those in a minute. Now, so what about Miss C? What have we learned here? Because this clearly is a, a form of cytokine storm, at least in some of the cases. It's clearly immune dysregulation, in my opinion. But what is it? So we, um, obviously, many with us, initially saw this as a form of Kawasaki disease. And I know that there are people who still believe that Miss C is just a form of Kawasaki disease that is triggered by SARS-CoV-2 infection. That may be, we still don't really know, um, but what's clear is that the presentation is slightly different from, from uh, the classical Kawasaki disease in that it affects more people, uh, children in the older age range as well as the young children. It has a slightly different presentation with more intestinal symptoms, 
than classical Kawasaki, uh, more myocarditis and maybe a little bit less frequently coronary artery aneurysms, even though they do over, there are overlaps as well here. And we, so we studied together with colleagues in Italy, in Rome, at the, uh, and, and other colleagues uh, at the Karolinska and, and in Sweden, in Uppsala. We, we studied patients with different presentations, so classical Kawasaki disease profiled prior to um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, healthy children, children with acute infection, often type mild sort of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and then patients with MIS-C, and we've increased these numbers now uh, a lot, but, but this was the initial publication in 2020. And then we measured, as I, saw, as I said in the beginning, all of the different things we can measure in the blood. Um, and, and initially what we found, if we focus on the cytokines now, given that this talk is about cytokine storms, what we see in this principal component analysis, which includes 112 cytokines, what we see is that acute COVID-19 in adults, either in ICU or in, um, in the ward with, with oxygen therapy, but not severely critically ill, um, has a very different cytokine profile from uh, MIS-C or, uh, sorry, MIS-C or Kawasaki disease. And, and there are specific cytokines that differ, but probably also combinations thereof. So it's not, the same type of immune dysregulation that we see in acute severe COVID-19. That was the first message. The other message is that Kawasaki disease, classical Kawasaki disease and MIS-C differs from one another with a few exceptions, which might be misdiagnosed patients or actually an overlapping syndrome. We also found in this study that there's broadly reactive autoantibodies in MIS-C, and this has been shown by a number of groups as well. And these are not classical disease-associated autoantibodies where all of the patients have an autoantibody to a particular epitope or a particular protein. In this case, it's very diffuse, variable uh, autoantibody profiles when we measure against 9,300 human proteins. And all of these samples were collected prior to IVIG, so this is not due to a contaminating antibodies in the IVIG prep. And it does indicate that B cell tolerance to self proteins have somehow been lost. Now, um, what one of the factors that can trigger loss of B cell tolerance is broad um, polyclonal activation of B cells by T cells that are activated in a non specific manner. And one such non specific T cell activation can come from super antigens. And so we know a number of diseases caused by superantigens. They either trigger T cells in the context of a uh, class uh, one or two molecule or directly by just only the T cell receptor being triggered um, by the superantigen. What we also know from work by Moshe Aditi's lab and, and, and colleagues is that the spike, at least at the level of uh, mod modeling, we still don't have a crystal structure of the superantigen motif, but, but there is a, at the modeling level, there is a motif that could serve as a superantigen, which has overlapping features with SEB from, uh, yes, strep. So, um, and if this superantigen exists, that could in theory explain why uh, B cell tolerance is lost, why we have broad T cell activation in MIS-C. But what's puzzling then is why does it happen one to two months after the acute infection? If it's a super antigen mediated disease, you would expect it to be most severe when the virus is most common, which is during the acute infection. Unless it's all about where the triggering happens, in which tissue, in which organ. And this is what's been proposed by a number of studies showing that um, you can actually identify uh, T cells with the particular T, T cell receptor V beta chain. So one of the T cell receptor chains, VB11-2, um, which is expanded in patients with MIS-C, um, but with a variable alpha chain, which is different from what you see in a normal uh, antigen-specific T cell activation um, response. So this suggests uh, super antigen-mediated disease, and uh, Lael Jonker's lab and, and colleagues 
suggested that this could be triggered by spike protein leaking across an imperfect uh, intestinal barrier when virus is persistent for a long time in the GI tract. So what we think now, and th this fits also with other observations such as persistent SARS-CoV-2 in a, this particular in a child without MIS-C but with continuous intestinal pain long after a mild COVID, or this observation from an adult with, which had persistent virus and ongoing B-cell somatic hypermutation suggesting continuous antigen exposure four months after SARS-CoV-2. So the picture is emerging of viral persistence in these children potentially triggering T-cells in a non-specific way by superantigen mediated effects leading to B-cell activation and cytokine release and so on. Now, um, then you know I have thought quite a bit about why this would only happen in young people. Why is children protected from severe COVID but more at risk of MIS-C as compared to adults and the elderly? And one possible explanation for this is that viral persistence is more likely in children and, and this is supported by studies in many other infections where we know that if the immune system does not mount all of its effector arms and we don't have T-cell activation that is polyclonal with bystander activation of multiple T-cell clones due to cytokine release and so on, but you only have a very narrow response, you might be more likely to keep some of the virus in the context of what we often call as immunologists as disease tolerance in contrast to disease resistance, where you fight the virus with everything you have. So one hypothesis then is that children would choose to favor disease tolerance, while adults would be more likely to mount all of their responses in a resistance response. Um, and one possible explanation for this that I have hypothesized is that it might have to do with energy allocation. Because we know that children with a very effective type 1 interferon response in their airways might say or might think <laughs> unconsciously that the virus is not at, at great risk for them and they, um, they might hold back some of their very costly immune responses to favor continued stature growth. Um, while an adult who is no longer growing might be more likely to mount a full immune response and thereby at higher risk of severe disease. But on the other hand, maybe less risk of viral persistence and miss C. So this is a hypothesis, but I think there's some data supporting this. Um, and this brings me into my final topic of today, which has to do with long COVID or persistent or post-acute COVID uh, syndromes. So within the COVID human genetic effort, which I'm a very happy and proud member, um, this global network has tackled all of the different disease presentations of SARS-CoV-2 infection throughout the pandemic. And we have formed a subgroup within this network to try to study long COVID. And we have decided to do this by focusing on the very, very severe cases, the most severe cases we can identify, where we have objective measures of disease, meaning uh, lung uh, dysfunction on, on a CT scan, uh, microvascular uh, dysfunction that can be visualized in different ways on MRI of the heart or other modalities, where we have um, autonomic dysregulation such as POTS, um, which, which, uh, which can be objectively verified. And, and we study these patients testing the following hypotheses that, number one, is this also another form of superantigen mediated disease that causes this um, uh, relapsing syndromes in, in patients following SARS-CoV-2? Is it an autoimmune condition? Can we identify autoantibodies to cytokines or to tissues? Is there an effect of uh, viral persistence also in long COVID, which has been suggested by some? And so we're investigating all of these different things um, in these very, very severe patients. And there's an interesting study in, in clinical infectious diseases by David Walt's lab at Harvard, which used a very sensitive digital ELISA approach, 
and we're actually able to measure um, spike protein circulating five to ten months following the SARS-CoV-2 virus infection in individuals with post-acute uh, COVID syndrome or PAS, which is the same as long COVID, for those of you who are not familiar with the terms. Um, and so that supports the idea that potentially viral persistence plays a role not only in MIS-C, but also in long COVID. Um, this, the super antigen, if I remind you of that, we've looked in our group at um, single cell T cell receptor sequences. We've basically identified memory CD4, CD8s and gamma delta T cells. We sort them out, we sequence their T cell receptors and we look for um, evidence of super antigen mediated activation as in MIS-C. We don't find any of that. Um, but what we do find is massive clonal expansion. So cells that in this case, a thousand sequenced CD8 memory T cells and all of these clones here have more than 20 copies, which is a pretty substantial uh, expansion in the repertoire, much more than you would expect um, from, from just a healthy individual. And this is up to a year, this is sampled a year after SARS-CoV-2 infection, indicating some form of, potentially at least, persistent antigen stimulation. We don't see the same TCR V beta chains as in MIS-C, and we also don't see them expanded. So the super antigen mediated activation, we think is less likely the cause of long COVID. Um, what about the other, the innate populations? Well, we do see, this is a study on MIS-C patients again, showing that antigen leaking through the gut barrier by Lyell Jonker's lab, um, can trigger neutrophils, it can cause immune complex formation. And we see in our studies that cytokines associated with uh, neutrophil activation, such as IL-8, um, is elevated in some, but not all, of the patients with long COVID when we compare them to individuals that are convalescent following SARS-CoV-2 infection without any evidence of long COVID. Actually, the levels are higher than we see in MIS-C even uh, in some of these individuals, but not all. We also see other cytokines that are upregulated, but not as significantly. And there is some evidence of T-cell exhaustion and, and chronic activation with elevated pdl one in circulation. Further sort of supporting this idea that there is an activation of uh, neutrophils is uh, looking at circulating nucleosomes. So we're looking at nucleosome H3 in circulation. And again, we see massive upregulation in some of the long COVID patients, but not all, indicating uh, cell death and, and obviously um, most likely a neutrophil mediated effect. And then just to finally sort of bring this home in relation to what I told you earlier about autoantibodies to, to endogenous proteins, and in this case, type one interferons, because we, we reasoned that if you have autoantibodies to type 1 interferons prior to be, becoming infected with SARS CoV virus 2, we know now from a number of groups that that's associated with life threatening SARS CoV virus 2 um, infection and pneumonia and, and cytokine storms. But what if you don't have the antibodies prior to the infection, but you develop neutralizing type 1 interferon antibodies? during your SARS-CoV virus 2 immune response, um, could that lead to viral resurgence, viral persistence and long COVID? It turns out that no, we don't think so. When we look at patients with uh, APS1 as a positive control, all of them have very high titers of neutralizing type 1 interferon autoantibodies. Uh, none of the healthy individuals do. Patients with long COVID or Kawasaki do not. MIS-C patients do not. And, and so we don't think that there's a role for type 1 interferon autoantibodies in long COVID, at least in our cohort. So, um, uh, Dirk Fell and, and, and other colleagues have reported anti-IL1RN or anti-IL1RA, the inhibitor of type 1, uh, the inhibitor of IL1, the endogenous inhibitor, as a means for, or as a, as a mechanism of MEC. Uh, and also vaccine adverse events. In our cohort, we find no such uh, autoantibodies in patients with long COVID either. Um, we do find them in some of the MIS-C patients, but very low levels compared to the neutralizing type one interferon antibodies. 
So what does this all mean if we bring it home? Well, if you put the immune response in the context of physiology, what we know about long COVID, particularly in individuals that have mild to moderate acute infection and then go on with really severe persistent symptoms, that seems to be prefer preferentially female of reproductive age, 20 to 50 or so years of age, um, while males are always more uh, at risk of severe disease, acute disease, they also seem to have less of this long COVID that is not caused by um, post-ICU uh, syndromes. And so could there be a, a similar difference here between the sexes in, in relation to energy allocation? One could hypothesize that females would be more likely to favor their energy used for reproductive purposes um, and thereby hold back some of their responses in the acute infection have milder acute infection, but then more likely to have viral persistence and long COVID. That's a hypothesis we're currently following up. Um, and it makes a, a striking resemblance to the Miss C that we see in children. Now, um, with this, I have uh, I've concluded my talk. I have a fantastic lab that I have to thank for everything. They've done all this experimental work and computational analysis. All of these collaborators within the COVID human genetic effort, but also collaborators um, around other aspects of this work. And I'm I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Can you hear me? I don't hear I, you, Kerry. Oh, no, I do. Thank you, Peter, for a fantastic uh, exposure. It was uh, uh, fascinating, I think, uh, for everyone uh, of us. I can see that a first question just came in, um, and this is from Paolo Palma. She mm. wonders, or he wonders, whether you imagine a role for androgens in long COVID. That's a great uh, question from my uh, dear collaborator, Paolo, in Rome. Um, yes, I think potentially uh, that is possible. We have a study where we are actually looking at uh, the role of sex hormones in modulating immunity. And I do think that plays a very important role in various aspects of this. It could play a role in um, both the severe acute infection in males more than females, but it might also have a role in, in, in the post-infectious disorder, yes. Um, so I, th I think the answer is yes, but the exact role we don't know yet. So there is a question, Karin, from Alexander below as well. I um, see. Says, can I talk better? Thanks, uh, Alexander. Is there a way to measure, monitor the innate immune response at individual level, and would it predict the risk of hypersensitivity to a given pump, pathogen-associated molecular pattern, slash AG, I think Alexander means antigen, and I had a related question, so maybe you can try to answer it all. Um, so the talk question about... is whether yeah, so the question is whether we can monitor it at an individual level. I mean, I would say that yes, we can do it in the research setting. I'm not sure we can do it at a clinical setting yes, yet. But if we could define the most important features of, a, of any, you know, what, and what I mean by the research setting is if you stimulate in vitro, you measure the functional responses, Idea, yes, we can track that at the individual level. I think we, we clearly see both due to genetic variants, but also some environmental states. Um, we do see differences in the responsiveness to TLR ligands, for example. Um, and so I think yes, but, but we don't have a good clinical test. And that's something that we should probably translate, um, I think. And did you have a related question, Fabrizio? Yeah. Okay. Do you mind if I ask my related question? So we can keep, ask your IELTS related. But you start yes. first. Yes. Thank you. Um, so you, you mentioned superantigen, responses to superantigen. Uh, yeah. And I have two related questions. One is Is there any difference between Kawasaki or response yeah. to superantigens in Kawasaki and response to superantigen in Miss C? Because, you know, Kawasaki has a long history of being a super yeah. antigen induced disease. Um, yeah. And Even the second though, is, can you yeah. monitor, can you identify in your system immunity evaluations, the patterns of a super antigen response? 
Yeah, so the first question is, I would say that the super antigen mediated Kawasaki disease is, ha is hotly debated. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I wouldn't say that that's sort of a consensus that Kawasaki is a super antigen mediated disease, but it's definitely something that has been discussed in multiple rounds of sort of studies. Um, and and I, I think the bet is still out there. I don't think it's a classical super antigen mediated disease such as, uh, you know, toxic shock or, or something like that. I don't think either of these conditions are, but I think there is a role for super antigen as in the pathogenesis. Um, and, 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 but there must be something else that triggers it, so to speak. Um, the other question is whether we can measure it. Yes, we can measure it in two ways. One is to measure it in the repertoire. If you see expansion of specific V beta chains with a multitude of V alpha chains, that is a clear indication that there's been non-specific triggering of T cells with that V beta chain, which is different from a classical antigen mediated uh, uh, response. But what we should be looking for, and I haven't seen anyone do that yet, is we should be looking for holes in the repertoire after the MIS-C, because you would expect that this unspecific activation of T cells by superantigen would eventually lead to loss of those T cells, right? And so we should be looking at and I, I haven't seen any reports, and we have we don't have those kind of samples to be able to follow MISI patients for long enough to be able to look for holes in the repertoire. But I hope that maybe some colleagues in this, maybe Alexandra or someone else who who, who might have studied this before, who could could follow these patients and look at that, because I think that's really would be interesting. Karina, can you see the questions? Uh, yes, I can see a question from Klaus Tenbrock. Who is saying, uh, great talk, Peter, you talked about immune senescence depending on certain infection. How do you measure this? Uh, telomere length, exhaustion markers, since at the beginning you explained that there is no consensus on how to define the healthy immune response. Yeah, yeah, no, so immune senescence, I mean, yes, there are certain markers that we think are upregulated, uh, exhaustion, you know, as well. Um, we don't measure telomere lengths routinely. Um, we, we typically go by phenotypic states, but also um, uh, responsiveness. So, so lack of, if you stimulate cells in vitro and you get a poor response, we, we, if you have a T-cell mediated response, we typically also consider that to be a, 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 an evidence of senescence, I guess. So it's indirect measures, I guess. Okay, thank you. Then I see a question from Alessandro Perplebani who asks, do you know whether if MIS-C or something similar to it, too long or, or too long COVID was observed also in SARS or MERS? Yeah, both of them actually. So there is a post-SARS, um, post-infectious disorder. There, is, there are post-infectious disorders following Ebola, following um, a number of infections. I mean, mononucleosis is a classic, right, where you have a prolonged um, infectious disease a pro, uh, period up to, I mean, many months following infectious mononucleosis in some teenagers. And so, yeah, this, these, are not, uh, these are not new, new things. Um, there are some elements of it that are different from historical post-infectious disorders, I would say, but the phenomenon as such is, it is well known. Thank you. There was one question that I think we missed before. Yeah. Has, has the immune response being evaluated in chronic fatigue syndrome and has been studied and compared to long COVID? Yeah, this we is are from Akila Kaviranjani. Yeah, that's a great point. And we, we, have, we are doing that. I know that several other groups are doing that. Um, there are clear evidence of there are clear overlapping features, even though both of these diagnoses are very vague and probably contains a spectrum of disease from rather mild to very debilitating severe diseases. But we have studied severe MECFS in the past before the COVID pandemic, and we find many striking similarities. The POTS, the post, uh, posterior orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and other autonomic dysregulation uh, aspects are very similar in the presentation. Um, the post-exertional malaise and the fatigue and, and there are similarities also in the immune system with uh, chronic T-cell activation, clonal expansion in the T-cell repertoire, suggestive of potentially viral or, you know, persistence of the pathogen. 
so there i think there are clear overlapping features there and and we and many others are looking looking at that i think i think Karina, do you want to ask one of your questions yeah unless i may uh, let uh, go one person before me because i see there is a question from ilia avrusin which we did not yet address um and uh, the question is you mentioned there are differences in the cytokine prof profile of Missy and kawasaki could you please tell about these differences and which yeah. exact cytokines were more, co more common in the one versus the others yeah so il-17 is the most clear example with il-17 is very highly upregulated in kawasaki disease but not in Missy. And it's been shown previously that TH17 cells are important in the Kawasaki disease pathogenesis. We see very high levels of IL-17 in, in Kawasaki, but not in MISC. So I would say that's the most striking one. There are many that are shared, gamma interferon, CXCL9, 10, and so on. But, um, but IL-17, I would say, is the most striking okay. difference. Well, Nina, I is your turn. I will that, force yeah, you to ask your question. Yes, here's an opportunity. Um, so I wonder, what we observe in patients with pediatric rheumatic conditions who are treated with biological drugs targeting uh, cytokines, we can yeah. see that over time, a response to a certain biological wins and, and even goes, goes away. And then we try another and then it goes. And then sometimes we can try again the initial one and have a response. So I wonder if you could comment on this related to your uh, findings and knowledge on immune variation uh, with time. And also, I think that's a, yeah, can I answer that first? And then I think yeah. I think that's a really fascinating observation that I'm I'm also very well well aware of. Um, I think you know all of these cytokines, the way I think of them, are parts of feedback loops, right? And so if you deplete one or you block one. Uh, there will be a response to that blockage. And, and eventually you could imagine that the immune system adapts to that um, new state. And, 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 and if it's not at the very heart of the pathogenesis, like if it's not really the trigger of the initial, uh, mm -hmm. initial trigger of disease, then the immune system will likely work around that particular intervention. And that's why, I mean, that's my interpretation at least of, of this, that and this is why, you know, I know we're always very scared of combination therapies because we're worried about infectious disease susceptibility and so on. But if we had a data-driven approach where we could actually measure things, I think we shouldn't be so scared of, of combinatorial treatments. It's just that we need to know what we're doing. Um, and, and, and yeah, so I, I think that would be the way to go. Combinatorial or changing treatment according to the immune profile at the time, which is related to Alexandra's question could you monitor it uh, within a patient over time yeah. That, um... yeah and i think i think we could and we should but we need to mm -hmm. standardize the way we do this so we know what to measure and we do it in every patient prior to biologics and then at the time of follow-up and maybe before switching biologics and, and me and fabrizio and, and klaus and others are, are in a network trying to do something like this uh, in some patients with with um, JIA, and I think I think these are the kinds of approaches that will be helpful. Um. Thank you. I see one uh, more question from Adrian Schwartz. Uh, did you look at the TCRV beta twenty one point three and CD four and CD eight cells in patients with long COVID? Yes, and we don't see them expanded. Okay. But, but they are expanded in, in MIS. These are the ones that are expanded in MIS-C. Mm -hmm. Is that correct or am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Long COVID is pretty heterogeneous from Incredible. a clinical point of view. And it's very difficult to focus on what exactly is sometimes and in some settings. Uh, yeah. Do you have? I'm, I'm sure you have an inclusion, um, a set of inclusion yeah. criteria that you're using. Can you share them with us? Absolutely. Yeah. So I can briefly summarize them because you're absolutely right, and this is what we were worried about. And much of the literature, I think, is 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 involving patients that 
that are poorly defined and that's why the immunology becomes really difficult to interpret and so what we did in the COVID human genetic effort was we focus only on individuals that have a PCR verified infection first of all and that have symptoms for more than three months and the symptoms have to be objectively measurable meaning either by an MRI or a lung uh, high resolution CT or polyneuropathy uh, measured by physiological tests uh, or um, POTS you know, which you can clearly quantify, but tilt test and other things. And so there has to be something that is objectively identifiable, so to speak, as a pathological organ, organ dysfunction or, or dysregulation. And then those patients we in include and we study their, uh, their whole genomes, looking for variants, uh, looking at their immune system uh, in various ways and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there are many more questions, but on the other hand, we are approaching uh, the, the end of the webinar. And this, there is someone who has a very urgent question. Um, if not, um, I think you always can write your questions to Absolutely. Uh, email me. Yeah. Because it's a, it has been a presentation and a discussion that's very inciting and uh, I'm sure people will have more uh, thoughts and questions afterwards. Thank so, you so much. Uh, no, thank you uh, very much, Peter. It was really fascinating. And um, I think I can come to a closure and thank everyone for participating uh, to this webinar, which I think we learned a lot. And um, we are also inviting you to join again for the next Tuesday lunch webinar, which will happen on the 3rd of January. Uh, Fabrizio, you have more information on this webinar? No, I know, the, I know the title, which is, I just lost it and I want to read it properly, um, Vaccination of Immunodeficient Patients and Their Social Network. And the speaker is going to be, and now I'm, 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 I'm going to pronounce it done properly, Nai Hues, um, I'll try it, uh, <laughs> Nai Hues, and you are uh, eagerly invited to join. So, Karina, okay. that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much. You can join using the registration link, which you will find on the RITA website. And also you can watch a replay of this webinar and previous webinars uh, on the RITA website. So thank you again. A big applause for Peter. And, uh, <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thanks, Fabrizio. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.